So this lecture is going to be a revision of the thermal physics topic. So what we're going to do is highlight the most important ideas from each lecture and then there's going to be a whole series of questions for you to try because it's been shown that one of the best ways to learn physics is to practice answering questions. Okay, but before we do that, a quick recap of the most important ideas from last lecture. Last lecture we were looking at heat transfer mechanisms. We talked about conduction, which happens in solids, and we said that P, which is the rate of heat transfer, so Q over time, is equal to Ka dt dx, where K is the thermal conductivity, which is dependent on the material. A is the cross-sectional area through which the heat is flowing. DT describes the temperature difference between either side of the body and DX is the width of that body. So we can also write this as P is equal to Ka TH minus TC. So that's the temperature of the hot side minus the temperature of the cold side over L where L is the length of the body. And we said that then sometimes if you were doing engineering you come across R values. So R values also describe the thermal conductivity of a material. And in this case, you can calculate the rate of heat transfer as A, the cross-sectional area, times TH minus TC over the sum of the R values for all the materials that you've used to make up your object. We then had a quick look at convection, and then we looked at radiation. So he said for radiation, we could calculate the rate of heat transfer using P is equal to sigma AET to the fourth. In this equation, sigma is Stefan's constant, A is the surface area of the body radiating the heat, E is the emissivity, a number between 0 and 1, and T is the temperature of the body. What we're most interested in usually is the net rate of heat flow. As the body's radiating heat, it is also absorbing heat from its surroundings. So the net rate of heat transfer is given by this equation here, where the T0 is the temperature of the surroundings. Okay, now onto a revision of the most important points from thermal physics. In lecture one, we met the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which said that if body A and body B were in thermal equilibrium with body C, then body A and body B were in thermal equilibrium with each other, i.e. if a and C have the same temperature, and B and C have the same temperature, then A and B have the same temperature. We saw that heat flows from a warmer body to a colder one. We met absolute zero, which is the absolute minimum temperature that we can have. Classically, at this temperature, all movement ceases. In quantum mechanics, we end up getting Bose-Einstein condensates and things happening here. But what you need to know is that it's the coldest possible temperature. It's zero kelvins or minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. We also met the formula for length contraction and expansion. The change in length of an object is equal to alpha, which is the expansion coefficient Li delta T, where this is the change in the temperature and this is the initial length. We then showed that for a volume of a substance, the change in volume is equal to 3 alpha times the initial volume times the change in temperature, where alpha is the linear expansion coefficient. For liquids, it doesn't make sense to talk about a linear expansion coefficient, so instead we have beta, the volume expansion coefficient. So to work out the change in volume of a liquid, we use the volume expansion coefficient times the initial volume times the change in temperature. In lecture two, we met the ideal gas law. We saw that there was two common forms of the ideal gas law. PV is equal to nRT, where n is the number of moles and R is the gas constant, 8.314. Or we can write it, PV is equal to capital N, where capital N is the number of molecules, KBT, where KB is Boltzmann's constant. We saw that 3 over 2 kBt was equal to a half m naught v squared. The bar over the top of the v squared means the average velocity squared. So this is a really our way of defining temperature for a gas. So the temperature is proportional to the translational kinetic energy. 
So in lecture three, you were introduced to the theorem of equipartition of energy, which tells us about how molecules can store energy. So you were introduced to the formula for internal energy, which is a half F N K B T. So F here is the number of degrees of freedom, which depends on the exact molecule. We will be looking at a couple of uh, examples in just a second. N is the number of molecules. K B is Boltzmann. Boltzmann's constant and T is the temperature. So how we can work out F depends on the type of molecule and also the temperature. So for a monotonic molecule, or it would be an atom in that case because it's just one atom by itself, it can only store energy as translational degrees of freedom. So in this case there are three degrees of freedom because it can move in the X, Y and Z direction. Now for a diatomic molecule, we've got more degrees of freedom. At low temperatures, again, it can only move, so that is three translational degrees of freedom. When we heat it up a bit above 100 kelvins, it then also starts to rotate. So if you think about two atoms joined together rotating, there's actually three axes about which it can rotate. However, if it rotates about the axis joining the middle of the two molecules together, we've got very, very little rotational energy stored in that way. because so you, you can barely see it move. It, it, it isn't changing its um, rotational energy as it goes. And so in this case, we've got two rotational degrees of freedom. So the three translational plus the two rotational gives us five degrees of freedom. As we heat up to high temperatures above about a thousand kelvins, those molecules also start to vibrate. And this is another way that they can store energy. So they've got two vibrational degrees of freedom. So at high temperatures, there's actually seven degrees of freedom, three translational, two rotational and two vibrational. So after that, we had a look at the first law of thermodynamics that told us that if we wanted to change the internal energy of the molecules in the gas, then there was two ways we could do this. We could add heat or we could do work. And so that's just what the first law of thermodynamics tells us. It's a very powerful equation. After that, we had a look, little bit of a look at the statistics of gases and we looked at a complicated equation for um, average molecular speeds and we saw how to use that a bit and we also derived this equation for the average mean path so that's the the average distance a molecule goes without colliding with another molecule is given by this equation here where d is the diameter of the molecules involved n is the number of molecules and v is the volume in lecture four we looked at calculating the work done on a gas the differential form is dW is equal to minus P dV. So we can integrate this, put it in an integral form, and work is equal to minus from the initial volume to the final volume, the integral of P dV. Usually in physics, you can just use the geometry to work out the area under the curve to work out the value of this integral. Very occasionally, you may need to substitute a function of V in for P and then actually integrate it. The work is always negative if the gas is expanding. As the gas expands, it's the gas doing the work. So the gas is actually losing energy in that case. We saw that the specific heat at constant volume was given by F over 2R, and the specific heat at constant pressure is equal to R plus CV, or CP minus CV is equal to R. These let you calculate the heat transfer in the constant volume or constant pressure case. The heat transfer is just given by N, C, delta T. Okay, in lecture five, we looked at different types of processes. An adiabatic process is one in which no heat is transferred. If we do a process very quickly, then there's no time for the heat to be transferred, and so this would be adiabatic. We derive the equation PV to the gamma is constant, where gamma is equal to CP on CV. And the change in internal energy in this case is just equal to the work done, as there is no heat transfer. An isothermal process is one at constant temperature. So in this case, PV is constant from our ideal gas law, and there is no change in the internal energy as the internal energy is a function of the temperature. So the change in internal energy in this case is zero. 
If we do something very slowly, then there's always time for it to come to equilibrium with its surrounds. And so this would be an isothermal case. Now the isobaric case is the constant pressure case. So typically this would be something carried out within the Earth's atmosphere, in which case the pressure applied is constant at atmospheric pressure. So in this case, T on V is constant and the heat transfer is given by NCP delta T. For an isovolumetric process, this is carried out at constant volume, so possibly within a sealed container. So P on T is equal to constant. The change in internal energy in this case is just equal to the heat transfer as there is no work done as the volume is not changing. And so this is equal to NCV delta T. In lecture 6, we were looking at specific and latent heat. We said that specific heat was the amount of energy, usually in the form of heat, that needs to be added to raise one kilogram of the substance, one degree C. And we can calculate the amount of heat that we need to add to change the temperature of a body using Q is equal to mc delta T, where m is the mass of the body, C is the specific heat, and delta T is the change in temperature. We said we also needed to add energy to make something undergo a phase transition. So in that case, Q was equal to the change in mass of the body at the higher energy state times the latent heat for that phase transition. We then briefly discussed nucleation sites and we said that phase transitions often start at nucleation sites and so you can actually superheat or super cool water if you don't have any of those nucleation sites. In lecture seven, we looked at heat transfer methods. We said there was conduction and the formula for conduction P, which is Q over T, is equal to the thermal conductivity times the area over which the heat was being conducted, so the surface area, over the change in temperature, the temperature difference between the two sides of the object through which the heat is being conducted, times the thickness of the object, dx is the thickness. We said there was also convection where hot air rises, but the formulas for this were very complicated. There's also radiation where the net rate of heat transfer through radiation is given by sigma A, the surface area E, the emissivity T to the 4. This is the temperature of the body in kelvins minus T naught to the 4. This is the temperature of the surroundings in kelvins. Okay, so now it's time to practice because this is the best way to learn physics. So have a go at these questions. If you get it wrong, don't worry. The first hint that comes up will tell you which lecture to go back to to revise this topic. The second hint, if you get it wrong a second time, will provide you with a video solution to that problem. But I strongly recommend that you try the problem as best as you can first before resorting to watching the videoed solution.